All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the Astronomy 99 Senior Thesis. And thesis presentation. Um, our three seniors uh, have been working since last semester, uh, learning the ropes on how to do basically graduate level research. And so we've covered a lot of things, including how to read and do a, uh, read research papers, doing a full literature search, um, keeping good notes, meeting with your advisor on a regular basis. Uh, even when you don't have something to update, we still want to meet with our advisor. So we. Basically, this is, uh, in some ways, it can be seen as a grad school prep program, even for those of us who are not going to astronomy graduate school. Some are going to medical school. <laughs> um, but it's been a real uh, fun year, and I'm really excited to see the culmination of their hard work this semester. Um, I don't know if you may have seen it in the email where I listed all of the speakers and their titles, but there is a distinct theme this uh, year uh, around exoplanets. And you might think, being an exoplanet person myself, that I had something to do with it. I want to assure you, I had nothing to do with it. I gave them free reign to wander the entire CFA and talk with all of our wonderful potential advisors, and each one of them came back with an exoplanet-themed uh, thesis topic. And uh, then I was happy, right? So <laughs> I, won't, I won't lie about that. Um, but there are, an exoplanet is a very diverse and broad-ranging field. Uh, it encompasses a lot of other areas of astrophysics, and I think you're going to see that. Um, with our first talk, Michael Albert is going to be talking about the uh, importance of understanding the host stars around which uh, the, our exoplanets that we discover um, are found, and implications for their overall structure, their atmospheres, and, and, and what we see from the demographics in terms of their, their radii. Um, Ananya Basal is going to be talking um, a little bit less about the star itself, but really zooming in on the planet. I mean really zooming in on the planet, the very microscopic molecular level, to understand the nature of these potential water worlds that have been found that have interior bulk densities comparable or uh, consistent with the bulk composition made out of water. Uh, so you're going to get to see detailed chemical simulations. And then um, Finally, Sydney is going to be talking about a, a system of planets that she found um, from the test mission and the detailed work that she's been doing to understand their orbital dynamics and in some extent, I think you're expanding into their interior structures. And so um, you're going to see a wide range of topics spanning the, um, the topic of, of exoplanets. Um, if you want to uh, read more about their abstracts and titles, there's a QR code underneath your seat. So if you just take your phone and scan the QR code, just kidding, it's a full day. Uh, <laughs> I think it's been, if you go for that, it's fine, but oh well. Um, I couldn't resist, it's April 1st. Uh, so anyway, with that, um, we're going to bring up our first speaker, Michael Albert, who's going to be talking to us about rocky planets orbiting M dwarfs. <laughs> Can everybody hear me well? Great. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, uh, hello, my name is Michael Alber. I'm a senior studying astrophysics. And today I would like to talk to you about why terrestrial planets orbiting M dwarfs either have a, an envelope of hydrogen and helium or do not. And as Professor Johnson already had alluded to, I will be focusing on characteristics of the host star. I would also like to thank my advisors, Professor Dave Charbonneau and Dr. Ryan Cloutier, who uh, really helped me a lot to put all of this together. So I'd, I would like to start by giving you a brief overview of the structure of my talk. First, I will give you some background information, and I will introduce the so-called radius gap and explain how that motivates my work. And then I will give some information on the characteristics of M dwarfs and why those are of importance. I will then discuss the data types I used and how I incorporated them into my analysis. I will then present my results and finally my conclusions. So coming to this so-called radius gap, Fulton et al. 2017 discovered that there, was a, that there were two separated peaks in planet size distribution. And this was done for terrestrial planets with, uh, that were orbiting sun-like stars. And the hypothesis behind this radius gap 
is that this difference is due to a gaseous envelope of hydrogen and helium around the rocky planet. Furthermore, Couché and Menu 2019 had confirmed this trend for uh, rocky planets around M dwarfs as well. So what are some causes for this radius gap? Uh, I will present, briefly present three theories. Uh, the brown circle represents the rocky planet with the white uh, envelope representing the gaseous envelope of hydrogen and helium, and the red arrows is the radiation. In the first case, the theory of photo, uh, photo evaporation. This is X-ray and UV radi radiation that causes hydrodynamic bulk escape of the gaseous envelope. In the theory of core powered mass loss, it is energy from the cooling of the interior of the planet, which causes the uh, mass loss of the envelope. And then gas poor formation, or perhaps more accurately, gas depleted formation, is when a rocky planet is either in a gas-rich environment, environment and can accumulate a gaseous envelope, or is in a gas-depleted environment and therefore will not have a gaseous envelope of hydrogen and helium. And in my talk today, I will focus on the theory of photoevaporation, and specifically we'll look at the effect of X-ray radiation. So why am I interested in M-dwarfs? There are some characteristics of M-dwarfs that might not make it suitable if we are looking at planets and are interested in the atmospheres of the planets that orbit them. This is due, uh, due to the stellar activity of the M-dwarf. They have a long pre-main sequence, so the planet will be exposed to radiation for a long time. And it's also very active, so it has a high X-ray and UV radiation. It also has irregular or radiation due to spots and flares of the endorph. Furthermore, the temperatures are cooler, which means that the habitable zones of the planets are also closer to the host star. So this impacts our planets. The high radiation for a long duration and the closeness of the planet means that it is not great conditions for life to be hosted or for the a gaseous envelope to remain intact due to the envelope escape that this causes. However, there are some characteristics that make M dwarfs interesting, which is their abundance. They are the most common type of star and therefore provide us with a lot of opportunities for observations. The detectability is very good due to their small size. The dip that a transiting exoplanet causes in the light curve is more noticeable and therefore it is easier for us to detect transiting exoplanets. And then finally, these observations can be made in the near future. In an ideal scenario, we can observe rocky planets orbiting sun-like stars at farther orbital distances where the environments are more suitable for life, but our technical capabilities aren't quite there yet, and so perhaps we should just start with looking at planets around M dwarfs. So just to summarize the picture that we have, we have a planet that is close to an M dwarf that is high in X-ray radiation, UV radiation. It is not great, character, uh, great conditions for life, but if they can hold on to their gaseous envelope of hydrogen and helium, they provide very interesting targets for exoplanet atmosphere observation. So there are three main characteristics of M dwarfs that I want to focus on today. One is the X-ray luminosity. Uh, this is because the X-rays of the host star can cause the envelope escape of the terrestrial planet. The rotation period, because the X-ray luminosity is very closely linked to the rotation period of the star. This is due to the star spinning, driving in a magnetic field which is then released, and this energy is then released in the form of X-rays. And therefore, a planet spinning rapidly will have a higher X-ray luminosity, and a planet spinning more slowly will have a lower X-ray luminosity. And then finally, I also want to look at flare rates, as these are very highly energetic phenomena caused by reconnection of magnetic field lines. And these outbursts also have a detrimental effect on the gaseous envelope and can contribute to envelope escape. 
So now I want to introduce the data that I used and how I use them for my analysis. I looked, I used the 15 parsec sample uh, from Winters et al. 2021. Uh, these were the stars I focused on, and they are within 15 parsecs. And what's important to note is that this does not include all M dwarfs within 15 parsecs. It's in a range of 0.1 to 0.3 solar masses. This, uh, these cutoffs were chosen to more easily allow the study of the planetary atmospheres. And this also coincides with the limit for the star being fully convective as well, which also differentiates it from other uh, earlier M dwarfs. And then this leaves me with 512 M dwarfs in the sample. So uh, in order to find the X-ray luminosity, I used different archival data from different catalogs, from different observatories. I used the uh, all, ROSAT All Sky Survey from the ROSAT satellite. I used early release data from Erosita that was presented in Magauda et al. And on the right, we can see the Erosita telescope, uh, which is very large. And on the top right, you can see the seven um, mirror systems that are used. I also used data from XMM Newton. Specifically, I used the Serendipitous catalog. And from Chandra, I use the Chandra source catalog. I also use data from pointed observations that were presented by Magauda et al. 2020. And these observations were made using XMM Newton and Chandra. And then I matched the stars in the 15 parsec sample uh, using the coordinates of the star and searching the catalogs via HIOSARC. And then I, in case there were multiple matches, I used the star with the smallest offset, or the source with the smallest offset. For the flare rates, I used the calculations made by Medina et al. 2020 using test light curves. These were made for 125 single stars in our sample. And this is for flares with energies greater than about 3.2 times 10 to the 31 ergs in the test band pass which converts to about 1.5 times 10 to the 32 ergs for the bolometric energy. Now I want to present the model that I used uh, to calculate envelope escape rates. I have the escape rate as the ratio of the photoevaporative power of the star over the gravitational potential energy. So that is the EX dot over the EG. And multiplying this by the mass of the envelope gives me the escape rate. So the picture we should have here is we have these two opposing um, forces. One is the uh, photoevaporative power, the x-rays that try to drive this bulk escape. And then the gravitational potential energy of the planet that is holding the envelope together and opposing that uh, that drive. And this gives me an equation that is in terms of several parameters. And I simplify this further by using the mass, ra mass radius relation. And this gives me the equation on the right. And I continue to simplify this by using the median luminosity of the saturated regime. What is the saturated regime? I will go into that uh, later when I present my results. And eta is the coefficient for the efficiency of, uh, the, of how efficient the x-rays are in driving this escape. Uh, so I have constants, and then I have the envelope escape rate in terms of two variables, the mass of the planet and the orbital separation. And then using this, I can also calculate uh, mass loss time scales. So how long does it take for the envelope to be completely stripped due to the radiation of the star? And using the fact that this is about, the envelope is about 1% of the planet's mass, which can also be seen because this is what is needed for a planet to jump the radius gap, I can also calculate this duration. In addition to this general model, I also calculate mass loss time scales of known transiting exoplanets for several stars in the uh, sample. 
And then additionally, I also calculate mass loss time scales of the TRAPPIST-1 system. This is a system that is, uh, that this is a star that is not in the sample because it's less than 0.1 solar masses, but at 12 parsecs, it is still close by and therefore interesting to observe. So now I would like to present my results. I first show a plot of luminosity ratio versus rotation period. On the y-axis, I have the log of the luminosity ratio. The luminosity ratio shows us how much of the total luminosity of the star is in x-rays. And then on the x-axis, I have the rotation period in days. And it is color-coded by the observatory or catalog that I used. And so what I would like to point out is the two distinct regimes that we see here. And this is what I refer to as, or what is called the saturated and unsaturated regime. So on the left, in the saturated regime at rotation periods below 10 days, we have a roughly constant value of the luminosity ratio. However, when we uh, go to increasing rotation periods, um, so when the star spins down, the uh, luminosity ratio declines uh, steeply, and this is referred to as the unsaturated regime. We do have a few outliers in the plot, but the, these are mainly due to being either highly eruptive variable stars, uh, or they are listed as high proper motion stars, so there's uh, the potential that they were improperly matched. I also look at the flare rate versus the rotation period. We see a very similar shape of a saturated and unsaturated regime. On the y-axis, I have the natural log of the flares per day. And uh, keep in mind, this is for flares greater than the 1.5 times 10 to the 32 ergs. And on the x-axis, again, I have rotation period in days. And here I have it color-coded by mass. We can see a pretty even mass distribution. Uh, based on this data, I cannot see, I cannot determine a correlation between the mass and whether the star will be in the saturated or unsaturated regime. And then the two outliers in the plot, um, it is unknown why they are such strong outliers, but one suggestion presented by Medina et al. 2020 is that they might be part of unknown binary systems that interfere with the measurements. And then finally, looking at the luminosity ratio versus the flare rate, where I have the luminosity ratio on the y-axis and flare rate on the x-axis, we see again these two separated regimes. In the, this case, the unsaturated, unsaturated regime is on the bottom left, and the saturated regime is on the top right. And again, we have three outliers. All three of them are listed as high proper motion stars. Um, but in the case of LHS 1339, um, we might be see, observing a star that is transitioning from the saturated to unsaturated regime as it has a high rotation period of roughly uh, 80 days. Um, so that could also be an explanation for why it is in between these two regimes. Also present my, the mass loss time scales for my general model of a kind of typical M dwarf in the saturated regime. Um, I also calculate the inner habitable zone and outer habitable zone, and the black lines show the mass loss time scale. So if we look at the habitable zone, um, a planet that is uh, Earth-like, so has a mass of roughly um, one Earth mass has a mass loss time scale of roughly 700 million years, and on the outer habitable zone, it is 5,000 million years. And if we compare this to the typical mass loss time scale of an M dwarf, which is 1,000 million years, this means that within this range, we should have some planets that can hold on to their gaseous envelope of hydrogen and helium. And the reason for my ranges on the axes are, so on the y-axis I have a range of one to eight um, Earth masses. This is because this is the range that the mass radius relation that I used is valid. And then 
orbital separation, I have a range of 0.01 to 1 AU. Uh, this was chosen because this includes the habitable zone and also allows me to compare three orders of magnitude. Now I look at specific mass loss time scales for known transiting exoplanets. We have quite a range in the, for the planets that I uh, looked at. And the, our largest mass loss uh, time is 180 giga years of LHS 1140b. And our shortest mass loss time scale is for that of TOI 540b, which is 45 million years. So if we look at just these mass loss time scales, for, we would expect that the theory of photo evaporation could potentially explain the radius gap, as we have some planets that have mass loss time scales greater than the typical mass loss time scale of an M dwarf, and some that are lower than the typical mass loss time scale. However, if we look at the first planet, for example, LHS 1140b, where we would expect a gaseous envelope of hydrogen and helium, we in fact do not see such an envelope. It is in fact rocky. And actually the only planet that is known to have a gaseous envelope amongst these is GJ1214b. That is also opposing to the mass loss time scale that I calculated, which is less than the uh, order of 1,000 million years. And so we would normally expect this planet to be rocky instead. So looking at just the mass loss time scales, we would initially expect this to explain the radius gap. However, if we look at these, uh, the examples of exoplanets, these contradict our expectations. So to summarize my conclusions and main findings, I have confirmed that we have saturated and unsaturated regimes. I saw that a planet near the outer habitable zone could hold on to its gaseous envelope. And many known exoplanets have mass loss time scales on the order of billions of years, which makes us think that they would be able to hold on to their gaseous envelope. This would speak in favor of photo evaporation, but when we actually look at the planets in question, we see that the absence or presence of the gaseous envelope does not match our expectations with the mass loss time scale. And this speaks against photo evaporation being the main cause of the radius gap, and instead suggests gas poor or gas depleted formation, where the, uh, where the planet does not have this uh, envelope of hydrogen and helium unless it is in a gas rich environment. So just to summarize with three key takeaways. One is that M dwarfs spin down and become inactive, and they usually do this on a scale of 1,000 million years. If we compare this to the mass loss time scales that I calculated, this speaks for photo evaporation being the main driver of the radius gap. But if we look at specific observed exoplanets, this speaks against photo evaporation and instead suggests a different theory such as gas poor or gas depleted formation. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and welcome any questions you might have. What questions do we have? Um, very nice talk. So you have one system that you said did have a gas envelope and the uh, Mass loss time scale was like 640 million years? Yeah. Uh, I can go back to that. Sure. That's is, is there an estimate of how old that star is and how it compares to? Um, the yes, there, there is an estimate. Um, however, I do not remember off the uh, top of my head. This was printed in Dave's uh, a paper. I'm not sure if uh, you might remember that. Um, off so, my head. Edward don't really show their age. That's the trouble. But from galactic kinematics, it looks like it's typical. It's five million years. So, does that? I mean, does that su suggest that there's something missing from the calculation of of, of the envelope evaporation time scale? Uh, yeah, I, 
it would be more accurate to include the the age of the of the star. Um, how I I kind of stuck with my uh, general model, hoping that this would kind of maintain the the trends that I had observed. And even if we take the age into account, um, it does uh, have a uh, does have to sustain a lot of uh, X-ray radiation. And the mass loss time scale, for which I forgot the exact model that uh, Professor Chauvinot used, but they had calculated a mass loss time scale of 700 million years. Um, so it does, uh, at least in this case, it does match with what one finds in literature. I think the main point here is with that being a calculated mass loss time scale compared to the likely age is that any planet around it should have already lost its envelope. Is that mm -hmm. right? And then you don't see it that it's lost its envelope? Uh, that is correct. Yeah. We, uh, we so, do see an envelope, even though we would expect it to have lost it. Did you do um, a sort of a tally of how many of these known planetary systems match um, the possibility of mass loss time scale versus not? Because you get, it looks like you, you give us some nice... Oh, okay. Um, I, you do a counting analysis, basically. Um, I do not have a uh, tally on here. We, I can quit the, I mean, out of all of these plants, the only one who is known to have the uh, gaseous envelope is GJ1214b. And in terms of the tally for, for planets that have a mass loss time scale that is roughly equal to the typical mass loss time scale of an M dwarf, um, without doing more detailed calculations, it might be a bit arbitrary whether I assign it to matching or not matching our expectations. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just curious about the unsaturated and the saturated regimes. At what rate does the, does the transition occur? Because you said that there could be one that is like in the transition. Yeah. So why can't we catch more? Is it really quick or something? Yeah. So uh, I didn't look, focus on the, on yeah. the rate of that. Uh, based on kind of the lack of other stars that are in that transition, uh, I would expect the transition to be uh, quick, but I cannot provide more details on that, and uh, that is also just a, a guess that we are looking at. That maybe it is due to a big high proper motion star, and I matched it incorrectly because the co coordinates were off, um, so this was a hypothesis that I didn't spend more time on to examine. I imagine it goes back to that problem that Ben Barr's not showing. Yeah, age exactly. Well. So, how do you, so yeah. it's very difficult to pick down, pin down the time scale. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank our speaker. She's going to be telling us about this uh, intriguing adolescent planetary system that she found in the test data. Um, so hi everyone, uh, my name is Sydney, I'm a senior at the college studying astrophysics and physics. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about my senior thesis presentation, which was advised by Dr. Sam Quinn, um, which I would like to extend a thank you to um, way in advance. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the adolescent uh, transiting mini-Neptunes that are orbiting around TOI 712. And to just get um, started, some key topics to keep in mind as I go throughout this talk is first I'm going to be addressing the uh, planet planetary evolution, specifically the radius evolution that occurs within the first billion years 
uh, for small planets. Um, and then second, I'm going to be talking again about the detection of the adolescent multi-planet system hosting three transiting mini-Neptunes and an additional Earth-sized candidate originally discovered by TESS orbiting TOI-712. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about how we kind of can explore the best fit parameters um, or the posteriors for our best fit with in-body simulations to help us refine um, what the true orbital properties of these systems are. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about photo evaporation models, which Michael went into great detail about, um, So, and how we can kind of use those paired with the observables that we have to better understand the internal structures of these small planets. Uh, so first, again, to kind of reiterate the radius valley. Um, so after analyzing the Kepler and K2 field, um, Fulton et al. 2017 found this bimodal distribution uh, where this upper regime ranging from about 2 um, to 3.5, or sorry, yeah, 2 to, two, uh, two to 3.5 Earth radii, um, which kind of represents a rocky core engulfed in a thick volatile envelope, um, and these are called mini Neptunes. And then this lower bimodal, um, this lower peak, um, which is thought to be essentially a mini Neptune that had its envelope stripped through some mass loss mechanism, and these range from about 1 to 1.5 Earth radii, and are deemed super Earths. Um, so again, we have this scarcity of planets ranging between about 1.5 and 2 Earth radii, uh, and this has been called the radius valley. Um, and this is thought to be somewhat dependent on um, the orbital period or a function of the orbital period or the orbital separation. And so from this, this really motivated us to say, well, what is the mechanism creating this gap? Like, why is there this scarcity? And why are these two, there are these two bimodal peaks? So I'm going to kind of be talking about two proposed competing uh, mass loss mechanisms. First being photoevaporation, which occurs on the time scale of about 100 million years. And again, this is where a star in its youth has an uh, excess amount of XUV emissions, um, which is incident onto the planet, which can potentially strip it of its thick envelope. And then in the other case, uh, core-powered mass loss, which is a little bit of a subtler process. Uh, so as a planet forms, it holds on to some of its internal heat from formation. Um, and as it ages, that heat is then radiated out from its core uh, through the envelope. And it can, again, strip the envelope, resulting in a super-Earth, but if the envelope remains intact, it um, stays in mini Neptune. So before I kind of start talking about the test mission, from those two um, mass loss mechanisms, we want to know what are the time scales, and we should be able to see what the observable differences are. So TESS provides us the opportunity to amass a collection of young planets spanning this age range um, that we can then analyze, uh, then look at what are the time scales and potentially better understand the actual mechanism. Uh, so to just reiterate, Tess, if I can play this animation. Uh, Tess is NASA's transiting exoplanet survey satellite. It's an all-sky uh, mission that was designed to target about 200,000 nearby bright stars uh, in hopes of fi finding transiting planets. Uh, so as a planet transits its host star, it passes in front of the host star from the point of view of the observer, blocking a small portion of its light, creating this dip um, in the received light that we get. Um, so as an all-sky survey, TESS was able to divide up the night sky um, up here into 26 sectors, each of these sectors getting about 27 days of observation. Um, however, this isn't really conducive to looking at maybe like temperate planets, um, whereas like the Kepler field looked at a single field of view for a very, very long time. These 26 days doesn't really allow us to um, explore long period, potentially temperate planets. But if you notice, as we get closer to the ecliptic poles, uh, we get overlaps in these observational sectors. Um, as we get essentially on top of the poles, we get near continuous viewing. So with that in mind, I'm going to be talking about TOI 712. Uh, TOI 712 was one of the pre-selected bright target stars, um, and it is relatively nearby, but its, be, its big factor is that it's about 1.4 degrees from the southern ecliptic pole, um, placing it right in that continuous viewing zone. So it's very um, beneficial when looking for those temperate long period planets. So this uh, TOI-712 was observed during year one and year three of the test mission. Uh, here is the day um, time of observation versus the normalized flux. And as we look at this, we can just already kind of see by eye that there's a lot of um, 
stuff going on with the star. So I'm going to call this stellar activity. I know some people might call it noise or stellar signal. I'm going to call it stellar signal. Um, and I really want to pay attention to this and moving forward because I want to know what can I learn about the host star uh, from this photometric observation. But before I get into that, I'm going to be talking about the planets that were detected um, orbiting this star. So TESS was able to identify two transiting planets, TOI 712b and c, um, which are identified here by the purple and pink. Um, it was additionally able to identify a single transit event and then kind of pair it with um, maybe some noise, placing it at like 53 days. But if we look at the pink, um, the pink transits, those are 51 days. So a 51 and a 53 day planet, that doesn't really make sense um, like in terms of stability. But so after going through and analyzing the light curve, we were able to identify that what TESS identified as a 600-day planet and a 53-day planet were actually just one single planet orbiting at 84.84 days, which is identified in the blue. So from this, we were able to identify three transiting planets. Um, and after modeling, uh, using ExoFast to model the system, we identified three transiting mini-Neptunes at 9.5, 51, and 80, about 85 days. Uh, first, I want to bring attention to the best fit radii. Uh, so TOI 712b is at two, about, just about two Earth radii, putting it right on the upper edge of the radius valley, um, whereas C and D are just your fairly typical um, mini Neptunes with about 2.5 and 2.7 Earth radii. Uh, the second thing I want to draw attention to is the best fit eccentricities. So for, specifically for B, our best fit eccentricity is 0.54 which is extremely, extremely eccentric, especially when looking at the case of a multi-planet system hosting small planets. So from Kepler and K2, when we look at the population of multi-planet systems, we've kind of find that most multi-planet systems are in fairly circular orbits um, with flat, mutually aligned orbits. So this really stands out as maybe this isn't quite right. Um, and when we look at the full um, posterior for the eccentricity, it's very broad. Um, and we're not able to rule out near uh, circular orbits. So we kind of wanted to keep this in mind as we move forward to think about the, dy the dynamics. But first, um, after detrending the light curve, putting the ExoFast best fit model on it, um, we then looked at the residuals and ran a TLS, or a transit least squares search, um, and identified an additional transiting candidate at about 4.32 days. Um, and this is an Earth-sized candidate uh, lighting right um, within the orbit of TOI 712b. Um, however, it is a very, very weak signal-to-noise event. Um, the transit depth is about 100 parts per million in the test band. So this is not something we could detect and confirm from the ground. Um, but potentially future observations by tests um, could allow this to surpass a signal-to-noise ratio and identify it as a true planetary companion. So going back to that stellar activity or stellar signal, um, so after running a periodogram across the entire light curve, we were able to identify a rotation period of about 12 and a half days. Um, so here I have plotted the full um, normalized light curve um, and phase folded it based on that period. And the colors for, that are more blue, that is um, the observations from year one, and the pink points are from year three. And so when we look at this, it immediately goes, oh, this kind of looks young, potentially young. Uh, so we wanted to use gyrochronology, which is an activity rotation age relation, um, which allows us to use the color of a star and its rotational period to derive an age estimate. And so from this rotation period of 12 and a half days and the color of TOI 712, uh, we were able to estimate an age of about 500 million years. So young, woo. Um, however, there is a caveat. Uh, so TOI 712 is a K-dwarf, um, and more recent investigations into the spin-down histories of low-mass stars have identified that there is a stalled period within the spin-down histories. Um, so if we look at this plot, this is the effective temperature or um, the spectral type of stars and their rotation periods. And this is about where TOI 712 would fall. And we can see that there's a clear overlap of those green and orange points, um, the green being about a giga year old, and the orange points being about 670 million years old. So when I place it right there, I can't distinguish it compared to these two populations. But what that tells us is, while gyrochronology on its own gave us an age estimate of about 500 million years, we also cannot rule out um, it being as old as about 1.1 giga years. 
So now I've learned about the star, um, and going back to the best fit exofast, um, for best ex the best fit for this system, um, and looking at those highly eccentric solutions, we were kind of motivated to see, well, is this full range of the posterior stable? Um, so we used in-body simulations with the rebound package um, and implemented the WH-FAST integrator to try and solve the TOI-712-4 or 5 body system, depending on the nature of dot .05. So first, looking at the three known planets that we've detected through transits. Um, so here, because we do expect that the eccentricities are more likely closer to circular orbits, uh, we explored the stability of them in a circular orbit, um, as well as looking at the full range of the exofast posteriors, which allow for these highly eccentric orbits as well. So these are our in-body simulation results from sampling that broad range of posteriors. Um, and so each one is the comparison of one planet's eccentricity with another. So B and B are on the first two compared to C and D. And this one compares the eccentricities of C and D. So looking at B, and, um, B compared to C and B compared to D, we still have stable solutions for extremely high eccentricities for B. And this is likely just a result of that large spacing between B and C. Uh, so just to reiterate, B orbits at about nine and a half days, where C orbits at 51 days. So because that, there's that large gap, even these really eccentric solutions are able to be stable. However, when we look at C and D, we are able to refine our understandings of the orbital parameters for this. Um, so we can see that there's these tail ends of instability on either side, um, refining the eccentricity that exofast derived. Uh, we're able to say, actually, it needs to be less than about 0.2 for each of them. So now, what if we include dot .05 as a planetary companion? So again, looking at the circular case, um, we see that it is likely that this is a possible orbital configuration. However, immediately when we include dot .05 with the best fit, um, exofast fit, we can see that this is not going to be a stable solution as we get orbit crossing here. And a, a 4.3 and a 9.5 day um, orbit crossing, not great for long-term stability. So exploring this, again, we sampled full full, from the full range of exofast posteriors. However, we really focused on this range um, down here for lower eccentricity solutions for TOI 712b. Um, and from that, we were able to say that if dot .05 is indeed a planetary companion, um, we're able to say that all three of the planet, uh, all three of the detected transiting mini Neptunes, need to have eccentricities lower than about 0.2. Um, therefore, greatly refining our understanding of the true orbital architecture of this system. So, going back to kind of that point of there's this large gap between B and C. Well, when we look at Kepler and K2 and their multi-planet systems, we know that most multi-planet systems tend to be fairly packed. So is it possible that there is just not, um, there's a planet transiting or orbiting in this region, and it's just maybe not transiting, it could have a slight um, mutual, uh, a slight um, inclination, or is it um, just something that we haven't detected yet through tests, um, and maybe future test observations will allow us to identify its transit. Um, additionally, because uh, TOI 712D, with an orbital period of about 85 days, uh, resides in the optimistic habitable zone of this host star. Um, we then again wanted to say, well, because all of these planets are already transiting, it's more likely that if there was an additional planet here, it would also transit. Um, and potentially, in again, future test um, cycles of observations, it would be identified. So first, looking at that gap between B and C, uh, we injected a three um, Earth mass planet and in the case of uh, all the orbits being circular, we find a very wide range of stability. Um, however, in the case when we allow um, the planets to have those, uh, essen those heightened eccentricities, we also find a range of um, stable orbits for a possible planet to be found within. Um, so this ranges from about 0.15 AU to 0.19 AU. Um, and really it just, just um, reiterates that when we inject these planets, um, we show that this, stable, this system is indeed stable with additional planetary companions, which could then compare it to um, the known population. We could say, oh, maybe it doesn't actually stand out as an outlier. It, doesn't, it is indeed packed. Um, however, we also want to say that maybe it is an outlier in the case of its eccentricity. Um, but even then, we still are able to say that this system could be packed um, and have this additional point of stability. 
So then looking at the habitable zone, um, so again, all three of the simulations injecting a 1, 3, and 10 Earth mass planet um, result in long -term, uh, robust stability uh, outside 0.7 AU. And for the 3 and 10 Earth mass planets, outside about 0.5 AU. Um, however, one interesting point of stability across all three is in this range. Um, and that is actually the 3 to 2 mean motion resonance point with the outer planet TY712D. Um, and again, so just to reiterate, because most multi planet systems that are known have low mutual inclinations, it is possible and it's a little more likely that if there were to be a planet within this area, we would be able to detect it via transits. Um, so maybe future test observations would allow that. Um, and here we've just shown that there are indeed stable uh, orbits that could host this additional planet if it were there. Um, so now we've learned a lot about the outer two planets, C and D, um, but now I kind of want to go back to TY712b. Um, and just to reiterate, it is a short period planet orbiting about at nine and a half days. Um, and I'm going to be talking about it through the lens of photo evaporation. So <clears throat> as TY712 sits at about 2.049 Earth radii, it's sitting right at the upper edge of that radius valley. So from comparison to similar young stars, we know that uh, these stars can exhibit like a wide range of XUV activity. Um, they could have high activity paths or low activity paths. Um, however, we don't have an XUV flux uh, measurement for TOI-712, so we wanted to explore all three. Uh, so here, the top panel is the potential high activity track for TOI-712, the middle is a medium, and the bottom is a low. And so kind of our thought behind this is that if we take, sorry, uh, if we take some combination of core masses ranging between one Earth mass and 20 Earth mass and paired it with uh, envelope mass fraction ranging between 0.01 and 20%, some combination would have to result in what we observe today. So I want to draw attention to these vertical lines. So first, we have an age range of 500 million years to 1.1 giga years. And then we have an unknown radii from the test observations of about two Earth radii. So if there was some combination of core masses and envelope mass fractions, and our understanding of photoevaporation is correct, only a few of these combinations would result in the observables that we have today, therefore giving us a glance into potentially the initial conditions of this uh, planet slight, uh, just after formation. So as we were able to do this, we actually identified that the, core mass, the minimum core mass for TOI-712b is 8.5 uh, Earth masses. Um, and while we have a wide range of uncertainties for the system, we don't really know the age because it is a K-dwarf, so we get that stall down period, uh, the stall spin down period. Um, additionally, we don't have an XUV measurement, but if we were to implement this um, practice onto maybe another system that has uh, maybe measured masses or a really well-constrained age um, or even an XUV uh, flux measurement for the host star, we could then use this to understand the internal structure of those planets. And then when applied to the entire population of known small planets, we could either say, oh, well, yes, our model of photo evaporation is correct. Um, or maybe there's like a continuous um, misunderstanding between the model and the observables, which would then allow us to refine our model um, to better match the actual observed population. So then putting TOI-712 into the context of the known exoplanet population. Uh, first, it is an extremely, or fairly bright, uh, long period system, one of the brightest uh, long period systems known to date, um, as well as looking at the young population. While it's not quite that young um, to maybe some of you, it's not quite 100 million years or even 50 million years, um, it's likely between 500 and a giga year, but it does allow us to explore an interesting space um, of planetary evolution as we think that maybe these processes of radius evolution occur within the first billion years and potentially beyond. Um, so adding this point to the population of known young planets um, allows us to explore what is happening across the whole picture and maybe get a better understanding of the timelines and mechanisms that result in radius evolution. Uh, so when looking at this system um, for potential future observations, uh, so here I've plotted the known equilibrium or the calculated equilibrium temperature of each of the, uh, each of the known small planets, and then their transmission spectros spectroscopy metric, 
um, which is an expected JWST tra transmission spectroscopy signal to noise ratio. Um, we see that while it's above the majority of um, the known small population, it's not quite at the top yet. But when you think about the potential scientific explanation, uh, specific, the specific scientific goals of um, an observation, it might stand out. So if you're just looking to get maybe a, m as many observations of atmospheres as possible, this might not be the system for you. But if you're trying to understand maybe the time scale of mass loss, or specifically regarding the outer two planets, C and D, um, those likely weren't subjected to photo evaporation or even core powered mass loss. So they likely reflect their primordial compositions. Um, and observations of them would potentially give us looks, uh, an look into the initial formation conditions and environments of many Neptunes. And again, TESS will continue to observe this system as it um, re-observes the southern hemisphere, and that would allow us to potentially confirm the nature of dot 05, which would then give us a greater understanding of the actual orbital parameters of this system. Um, so yeah, just to summarize, uh, TOI-712 is an adolescent system hosting three transiting mini Neptunes and an additional Earth-sized candidate. Uh, the system achieves long-term stability, even in the case when it is potentially highly eccentric. Um, and models suggest that TOI 712b might become either a radius valley planet or even cross the radius valley. Um, and future observations of the atmospheres can help us study the process of radial, radius evolution um, throughout the first billion years and potentially the initial primordial compositions of many Neptunes as they form in temperate regions. Um, and further observations are required to confirm the nature of dot 05, but with those, we would be able to greatly refine our understanding of the true, ob true orbital architecture of this system. Oh, and that's it. So, yeah, thank you so much for listening. So, you gave credit to Tess for finding this system, but I was wondering if there was a human that was involved in the finding system. So, we, um, so the first two planets were identified by Tess. Um, and then Tess identified a dot of three candidate and a dot of four candidate. Um, and again, one of those was like a 638 day planet. Um, and the other one, which that was only identified in year three, um, but with just the year one data, um, it identified a 53 day planet. Um, and we were able to show that that like, wasn't actually real. Um, what was really happening was there's this transit at 84.84 days. Um, and I remember like when I got the notification that Exofop had that 600 one, I emailed Sam and I was like, look, there's another planet. And he was like, no, <laughs> that's just the same one, multiplied by four. Um, but yeah, so we were able to do that um, on our own uh, behalf, really um, in part of Andrew Vandenberg and his amazing method um, to like just re-extract really, really nice clean light curves from tests. Can you, help out a bit? You, you say we a lot, but I think you need to say I more. <laughs> <laughs> this was your work. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so actually, in that sort of the same vein, did, did Tess reco reco uh, recover 05? You said that you ran a TLS and found 05, but is it actually a TOI? Um, so it is not a TOI. Um, Tess did not recover it. Uh, we were able to recover it. Um, we were able to show that it is um, pre present in if you separated it in year one, year two, or year three, then if you did another few chunks and another few chunks. Um, and then we did run a variety of tests to see like this isn't um, just from maybe a nearby eclipsing binary. Um, it is on the target star. Uh, we were able to redo this analysis just with the SAP data and also find it. Um, so while again, the signal to noise is really, really low. Um, it's not that low, but it's what low. That's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, so we like ran all these tests, but again, like we're still not truly able to say with confidence this, that this is a planetary companion. But you did see it in year one, and then independently in year three. Yes, that's yeah. a great check. That's awesome. Yeah, um, great analysis. I just have a question about the end body simulation. Yeah. So what is the total amount of time that you integrated over? Oh, and, yes. Um, did you also see any kind of substantial changes in eccentricity over time, especially for those really high eccentricity models? Yes. Um, like, did it circularize? No. So um, this is across 300,000 years. Um, so there is kind of this like combination of um, 
you know, there's like some relation between B and then the paired eccentricities of C and D. Um, and if you kind of remember that one plot of um, just C and D, there was like that regime that wasn't allowed. Um, those were orbit crossing. Um, so there is like more of an interaction between C and D, which is why you have these finer features. Um, but there is an overall continued eccentricity variation. Um, so it does not result in a circular um, solution for all three planets when evolved. Um, we evolved following, I think, Mayo et al. 2019, question mark, um, 10 to the 9 orbits of the outer planet. Um, and sorry, what was the second half of your question? Oh, that was it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Of, of okay. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, great talk. Um, what are the plans to get radio velocities, try to measure the masses? You know, it's you, you said it's a bright star. Are there... Is that going to be difficult to do for other reasons? Or? Uh, so because there's that stellar um, rotation that's prevalent in the photometric light curve with, like, I think, 2% um, amplitude variations, and the signal for the rotation is 12 and a half days, that uh, inner planet is a nine and a half day orbit, you need a lot of RVs. Um, however, I was emailed by um, someone looking to potentially explore this with espresso. Um, I I think they're, again, probably going to follow that logic and it might just take too much time to actually explore it. Um, but that was really my motivation with like the photo evaporation model of like, well, we have a really, really great set of data from tests, so like why can't we apply other um, sets of knowledge to just better understand what the actual parameters are? Um, so that's kind of why I explored it, um, looking at the masses through that. But I think like the predicted signal is about like two and a half meters per second. Um, so it, if you really wanted to, <laughs> but no, it not really a great candidate for um, mass measurements. Unless Sam has a different view. No, you got that right. Yeah. Okay. The activity that does you it. Yeah. It's hard. All right, so we're at time. Thanks, Sydney. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? So, hi. My name is Nanya Bunsel. Um, I am a senior studying astrophysics, and I'm very excited to share my thesis work with you guys today. Um, so, I, this year, worked on producing and analyzing theoretical models of built ice chemistry in water worlds, specifically with the chemical ternary system of carbon dioxide, methane, and water, with the help of my wonderful mentor, Dr. Amit Levi. He couldn't be here today, but I did want to give him a wonderful shout-out. Great. So, my goal for this thesis was to derive ratios of carbon dioxide and methane that should be present in water world atmospheres due solely to nature. The reason for this is because we're entering a new phase of research where we're able to physically measure the atmospheric chemistry of exoplanets. And one of the goals, I think, is to search for life. Um, and CH4, and, or methane carbon dioxide, is a very important biosignature pair. This is because Michael talked about hydrogen in atmospheres. And if there is a lot of hydrogen in atmospheres, we expect carbon to be reduced in forms of methane. But if we also see CO2, this is an oxidized form of carbon. So if we see them together, this may be due to life. However, we do need to understand the baseline abundances of these chemicals in order to derive any meaning from our physical observations. So today, I talk about outgassing from water world interiors for these specific chemicals. So a few key points to take with you through this presentation is that we hypothesize that there are set constraints on the ratios of carbon dioxide and methane that should be present in water world atmospheres due solely to nature. Physically observing spectra from exoplanet atmospheres for these chemicals should give us a better understanding of whether or not they are actually water worlds. And we may be able to attribute deviations from these natural constraints to signatures of life. 
So today I'm going to talk through a quick introduction, a methodology, the results, and the conclusions that I got from those results. So, as talked about previously, NASA has several missions that detect exoplanets, including Kepler and TESS. Using the transit method, they are able to not only detect the planet, but get a radius and an inclination for this planet, as well as, in ground-based follow-ups, get a constrained mass. So the mass and radius become really, really important because we can derive these mass radius plots. So I understand there's a lot going on here. I'm going to draw your eye to where we're focusing on water worlds. So we characterize water worlds based on a bulk density from this mass and radius because they're intermediate between rocky worlds and gaseous planets. However, there is a great deal of uncertainty with just declaring these water worlds based on a density. So we want to understand a little bit more about their structure and their chemistry to get a full understanding. So, their structure. They are hypothesized to have a high-pressure ice mantle below a surface ocean. Um, the ocean floor should have pressures around an um, order of magnitude of one gigapascal. And we want to look at the types of chemistry that can form around these pressures. We find that there are things, uh, or structures called filled ices. So, to understand filled ices, we have to understand clathrite hydrates. So these hydrates are water lattice structures or cages that have gas molecules inside. And these hydrates are actually hypothesized to be found on Titan um, and is a reservoir of methane on Titan. But under the pressures that we see in water worlds around that order of magnitude of one GPA, these structures transform to be filled ices. So on the right, we have a structure of filled ice with the red cage being our water lattice and our guest molecules being our black molecules. So these um, gas molecules can be CH4, which we will examine, CO2, which we will also examine, and then we can mix them to be both CO2 and CH4. So these are the three systems that we will be analyzing today. So to put it all together, the high-pressure ice mantle is thought to convect. So when these filled ices are present on the ocean floor, if their density is less than that of the overlying ocean, there's a possibility that they are buoyant, can float in the ocean, depressurize, and outgas its contents into the atmosphere, which can give us a little bit of understanding about the abundances that we have there. So how did we do this? We used a computer simulation program specifically called CP2K. This is for chemistry that we used. Um, and we use two simulations, energy relaxation and molecular dynamics. Energy relaxation is where we optimize the total energy of the system at zero Kelvin. Um, and because that's zero Kelvin, this is the potential energy of the system. We run cell optimization, which is we give the computer a structure of our filled ice, an initial structure. It varies the volume of the structure to obtain or minimize the internal energy. For finite temperature, we use molecular dynamics, which displays the physical movements of atoms and molecules over a set period of time. These trajectories are based on satisfying Newton's uh, equations for motion, as well as using intermolecular forces. For us, we'll use Van der Waals forces. And we also um, solve for the electrons, solving for the Schrodinger equation of the many-body electron system. So in short, we give the computer initial conditions, and we, we set it to solve for specific quantities. This picture is actually one of our structures. This is our methane water system. Um, so the red is our water lattice, and the green is our methane gaseous molecules. Great. So a little bit more about what we give the computer, just for a better understanding. We give the computer gaseous and plane wave basis. This is because it is known to model water very well, and we want it to solve the wave function for these electron system. We give it pseudopotentials. This represents the electrons that are closest to the nucleus. This is because these electrons are so coolingly interacted with the nucleus that they're not really in getting involved in any of the other chemistry that's happening, so we can almost solve for them already. We have our van der Waals forces, which are the intermolecular forces that we'll be using. We have our initial structure. So we say use carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, these many, these coordinates, and then take and uh, play with this, the structure from there and the cell optimization file, which tells it to run cell optimization. So the output quantities that we get are cell parameters. So here is an example plot. I don't have time to go through all the plots that we did, but these are just a few intermediate steps that I wanted to share. We also output a volume. Here's another example plot, and the internal energy that it minimizes to. We can calculate things based on these outputs. So we calculate a density for our structure, another example plot, an enthalpy for our structure, Enthalpy of formation or mixing, entropy of formation and mixing, and 
entropy of, um, or sorry, free energy of formation. So the free energy of formation is really important because this is what tells us whether or not the structures are actually stable and whether or not they actually form. Um, the density will become important too because we do want to understand whether or not um, those structures are buoyant in that surface ocean. Great. Oh, for um, finite temperature analysis, there are a few differences. So instead of a cell optimization file, we have an NPT file, which tells the system to hold the number of moles constant, the, num the pressure constant, and the temperature constant. And then we also get average cell parameters, average volume, and average internal energy. This is because we're fluctuating our structure over a set period of time, so we kind of have to average. Great, so what should we find? Um, just for jargon, um, I want to make sure that you understand that the MH3 that I referred to is just um, only CH4 or only methane guest molecules inside a water lattice structure. Our carbon dioxide hydrate is just carbon dioxide guest molecules, and our CH3 or carbon hydrate is both together in the structure. So we first did a 0K analysis, um, and we wanted to corroborate with experimental data, almost like a sanity check, to make sure that our computer program is running OK. So we ran six compositions of our methane hydrate filled ice with varying num uh, amounts of CH4, but we kept the amount of H2O in the water lattice constant at 64. So we varied our CH4 from 29 to 34 guest molecules. So here we have the free energy of formation. Um, on, for all three of our pressures, and we found that only the composition with one to two gas molecules, or in our case, 32 to 64, um, presented with a negative free energy of formation. So we see that here. What this means is that this is the only structure that is stable and the only structure that would form under these conditions. We did this again for our carbon dioxide hydrate. So we had the same ratios of um, gas molecules to water molecules, except instead of CH4, we had CO2. Um, and we ran this under six different pressures. This is because um, with experimental data, there is some discrepancy of whether or not this hydrate does form under pressures of 0.8 and 1 GPA. So we wanted to account for that in our, um, in our analysis. So what we found was that all compositions had a positive free energy of formation um, and that the carbon dioxide hydrate was not, in fact, stable at any of the pressures studied. Um, we did, however, find it's important that 32 to 64, which was the stable formation for our methane hydrate, was the minimum um, here. So it's over here. Um, so this was a promising result that maybe this 32 to 64 or 1 to 2 guest molecules to water molecules was the preferred structure of filled ice. So um, we decided to move from 0K to finite temperature. Um, we had to retest our, both our binary systems. Um, so we have three compositions here. We have uh, centered around 32 to 64, so 31, 32, and 33 guest molecules with 64 water molecules. Um, each composition was run under a pressure of 3 GPA. As I said, we're keeping the pressure constant, and we're also keeping the temperature constant at a temperature of 420K. I'm oh, sorry, 3 GPA. Yeah, 3 GPA. Okay. Um, so we've got a density and a free energy of formation plot. So our blue line is our carbon dioxide hydrate, and our red line is our methane hydrate. We found that the density of our carbon dioxide hydrate was higher than that of liquid water. So even if it did form, it would most likely be gravitationally stable on the ocean floor. On the ocean floor. Um, we found that our methane hydrate was uh, less dense than liquid water. So if that forms, it should be buoyant in the ocean and maybe depressurize an outgas. So does it form? Looking at our free energy of formation, we see that all compositions of our carbon dioxide hydrate had still had a positive free energy of formation, and therefore it does not form in any of these conditions. We did find that our methane hydrate had a minimum negative free energy of formation that was below that of zero, um, and it was at the same composition of 32 to 64. So our methane hydrate does, is stable and therefore does form. Um, and knowing that the density is less than liquid water, this structure could potentially uh, be buoyant in the liquid water, surface ocean, depressurize an outgas. So now that we know this, we want to ensure that we're not missing some CO2. If we can combine CO2 and methane in a structure and have that be stable as well. So we look at the ternary system next. So for our ternary system, we had four compositions. 
Because we found that 32 to 64 gas molecules to water molecules was a minimum for the free energy, we stuck with this number and instead varied the amount of CO2 to CH4 that we had in, the, in that 32. So we had 1 CO2 to 31, 8 to 24, 16 to 16, and so on. So each composition was run under the same, 3 GPA and a temperature of 420K. So what we found for the density is that the ratios of um, CO2 to CH4 that were less than 16 to 16 or 1 to 1 were less dense than liquid water. So if these ratios are stable, if they form, they could be buoyant in the, uh, in the liquid ocean, depressurized, and outgas. What we find is that the ratio of CO2 to CH4 must be less than 1 to 31 um, to have a negative free energy formation. That is, that it has to have a very low CO2 to CH4 con uh, CO2 ratio to form. So, full disclosure, I got this um, 1 to 31 two days ago. It needs to be a little bit more analyzed, but I thought I would include it because it is an interesting result um, because you can't just interpolate between here and say that there are some ratio of CO2. Great. So what can we actually conclude from this? So we did find that the 1 to 2 gas molecule to water composition produced a minimum free energy for both our binary systems and therefore is the favored filled ice structure. For our binary systems, we found that the methane hydrate forms with a 1 to 2 composition under all the pressures, or sorry, under some of the pressures studied. Oh, no, sorry, all the pressures studied. Um, and uh, finite temperature analysis and 0K as well. We found that our carbon hydrate filled ice does not form under the pressure studied here in both our 0K and finite temperature analysis. For our ternary system, we found that the filled ice system only forms with very low ratios of carbon dioxide to methane, less than 1 to 31. And we found that the ternary system filled ice will be lower in density for these same ratios. So if we do find, if we increase the amount of molecules we're looking at, say 1 to a million CH4, um, we could you know, say that these may float in the ocean, outgas into the atmosphere. So in conclusion, there should be a low CO2 to CH4 ratio in the atmosphere of water worlds. So where do you go with this? Um, so we saw a very strong result on what type of carbon molecules can outgas based on our ternary system, but there are a lot of different atmospheres out there and a lot of different analysts. Uh, exoplanets that we're going to be analyzing. So we should go and look at other type of molecules to understand these two. So that can see um, nitrogen, hydrogen, other forms of oxygen, things like that, to see what outgasses in that atmosphere as well. Great. Thank you. So did you run those on the, on the CIPACE computers? Yeah, cluster, okay. or the cluster, yeah. The cluster, yeah. Uh, yes. How, how long did it take to, to run? Um, very long. Um, you, have to send them, you have to send them in like a few times too because it only do like one third of them and then you have to do it again. Um, but some of them took like two, three weeks. Oh, wow. Long, longer, yeah, maybe sometimes, yeah. <laughs> and then they fail and then you have to do it again, so then it's the whole thing. <laughs> these pressures well constrained through just dynamics. Um, so this is based on literature, yeah, okay. but um, I'm sure, like, for example, Titan obviously has different pressures, yep. um, and different size planets or might have different pressures. Um, this is basically just a hypothesized structure of water world that we took with our, our simulations. Yep. Okay. Yeah. But you can also run the simulations under different pressures and, and see what happens. Oh, it does take three weeks, though, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, similar question. I'm wondering why you chose for the Oh, okay. So we use, we use 420K because under the pressure that we're assuming through GPA, um, we do know that the, actually, let me go, actually no, because there's a lot of intricacies. Um, if we go back to the structure, um, we do see that there's an ocean and then a high pressure ice mantle. So we know that ice has to melt at that ocean floor. Um, so we take, um, under that pressure, we have ice 7 specifically that we think is in that high pressure ice mantle. And we look at the melting curve for ice 7 and see that 420K is where it melts. So we take that for our uh, temperature. But again, you can run, or theoretically run this simulation under different uh, temperatures and pressures to understand that a little bit better. All right. So really neat results. Okay. And you're doing, so each of these calculations is so time intensive. 
Yep. You know, you only get to discreetly sample. And yes. there's a few cases where you had one of your runs which actually had a negative Gibbs free energy and right. all the others didn't. Right. And um, uh, what I'm wondering is what's the possibility to do uh, now go back and do a search in the vicinity there, like you were sort of fitting a right. curve, and right. it's great that you found one, but what you'd love to do now is really figure out like how much stability there is locally, and yes. is that just going to take two weeks for every new point? Or? So, there's also a constraint with the size of the system that you can use, so we do like, we did around like 31 to 32 to 33 to 64 water molecules, <clears throat> um, unfortunately we can't go all that, like we can go a little bit larger, but not like very large, it would be a great future study to do. Um, it does take time, but I think that would be a great thing to understand. Um, I do also think that we take the minimum. It does look like that's the minimum, but it is possible that you know things around that could also um, could shift and it could be a minimum. So yeah, I agree that would be a good thing to look into. But um, I'm not sure there is a constraint on the size of the system we can put. Um, but if it's within that, I think that would be a good thing to study. Yep. Like in all the cases you ran, that, that the carbon dioxide just was a very unfriendly thing to put in the middle of these Yeah. Face yeah. <laughs> is, um, that, is, this is that something that was sort of expected, or is there, is there a good physical or chemical reason why that would be happening? And, and also, are there any concerns about numerical methods that might lead? Like, do you think there's any sensitivity in numerical methods that might lead to, to it treating CO2 in a particular way differently than CO2? It's definitely possible. Um, no computer simulation is perfect. Um, but in terms of the CO2, we're not quite sure. There's a lot of literature that kind of go back and forth on whether or not it is possible to be stable, which is why we kind of did that check. We found that it wasn't stable at those pressures. Um, there's also a lot of discrepancy on temperature, if it's temperature sensitive. I'm um, not quite sure exactly what CO2 is. It could be just, it obviously is maybe a heavier molecule. It Oxygen is, you know, could like make some repulsion that just makes it a little bit too much energy in the system and per, like makes a lot of stress in the structure um, with that water. So I don't know. Um, it could be just maybe like a repulsive force that just makes the structure not really fun to be in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Great job, seniors. And uh, I wish you all the best with your written portions. <laughs> You're almost there, though. Thank you, everybody, for coming out today and supporting us and listening to their talks. And I uh, hope you all do your own. Thank you.